Good morning, brothers and sisters. And it is good for us to be here in the presence of the Lord. Uh, obviously, I'm no stranger. I consider this church is part of our family as well. So thank you so much for having me here in order to share the word of the Lord with you this morning. Uh, there is no better place for any born-again Christian to be in. It should be the desire of the psalmist, uh, Psalm 84. David had that desire. He said, one day in thy court is better than a thousand, and I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in tent of wickedness. This is where we ought to be, uh, in the presence of the Lord, where we will get exhorted and reminded of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this morning, uh, I chose a very practical uh, message that would exhort all our hearts, and it's the choices that the believers make in everyday life and the consequences of those choices that we will reap, whether they are for the benefit for the glory of God or whether they are for the opposite. And in the chapter that our dear brother read for us, chapter 13 of the book of Genesis, we see just uh, that two men of God uh, called by God, and I titled the message, Two Chosen and with Two Life Choices. So um, we will not read the chapter again, but what I would like to do is just give a brief summary of the genealogy. Who is Abraham or Abraham? initially his name before the Lord changed his name from exalted father, the meaning of Abraham to the father of multitude or the father of many nations when God has changed his name. Uh, we read that he is a descendant of Shem. His father's name was Terah. Terah had three sons. Uh, obviously, the order that the genealogy is being mentioned in chapter 11 of Genesis, it's not in the chronological order or Abraham seems to be the eldest, but that's not the way it is. It seems that Abraham was born way later when his father Terah was about 130 years old. Some other scholars argue that, that he is the eldest and so forth, but that's not the point. But he was one of three sons. Um, the, two, the two other brothers, one is Nahor, or Nahur we call him, and the other one is Haran. Haran is the father of Lot, who actually died in the Ur of the Chaldeans before his father. He died early. And so at that particular time, uh, Terah decided to take his son Abram and his grandson Lot, along with Sarai, Abram's wife, and to travel into the land of Canaan. It seems that Nahor remained in Ur of the Chaldean. The other son remained there. And so we read in chapter 12, the calling of God to Abraham. God calls him to leave his family, his house, and uh, his father's house, and to follow him into the land where God has promised to give him and his descendants as an inheritance. And God promised Abraham that he will make him a great name, and he will be a blessing, and God will bless those who blesses him and curses him who curses him. Um, and all the families of the earth will be blessed by Abraham. And so we see Abraham departed and followed the calling of the Lord. And if you will follow the reading in chapter 12 and chapter 13, you will also uh, see the phrase repeated, and Lot went with him. So Lot was with Abraham throughout this calling and into this journey to follow the living and true God. And so what we see is... The spotlight is focused upon Abraham and not Lot. Now, if we were to just read the Old Testament narrative and the life of Lot will give us nothing but negative all the way through. There is nothing really honorable that we read in the life of Lot in the Old Testament, except we, we can glean that he was God's possession from chapter 19 when the angels of the Lord were sent to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah and then we see that the angels drag him by the hand and take him out. That's the only indication we've got in the Old Testament that Lot was a possession of the Lord. But if you follow his activities and his choice that he made in his life, 
you will never ever uh, gather from the choices that he's made that he was a child of God until you read in the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 7 when Peter testifies that Lot who was righteous who vexed his spirit day after day looking and listening to all the evil deeds that were conducted by the evil people that lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. So that's where we, we get that this man was a just man. Lot also was called by God. And so we are going to focus upon the life of these two people this morning and I'll try to summarize the whole message about the choices of these two believers. This will be for us as we speak today, there would be some believers who would fall in the category, maybe not to the extent of Lot, or maybe we may think that is not the case with certain believers, but sadly there would be certain people who would take grace for granted and would live their own life and make their own choices. But eventually we'll see the consequences will be reaped in their life, not for the blessing. And so in chapter 12, the first thing that we see Abraham, uh, Abraham's obedience is that he established an altar to the Lord when God revealed himself to him and called him to follow after him. He was anchored in that place of worship. Although chapter 12 reveals a downfall and the failure of this great man of God, Abraham. And we know that when God called him, he moved further south. He built another altar, then he moved south. There was famine in the land and he went further down south into the land of Egypt. And we know Egypt in scripture is a representative of the whole world we live in, godless. Uh, they have no regard for the God of heaven and, and they live for the, the pleasures of their own life day by day. And it was a very prosperous and a very rich country even in the days of Abraham. There in the land of Egypt, we see one failure from that man of God. And uh, I think if you read on in chapter 20, it was a command done by Abraham to say that whenever they traveled from place to place, Sarai was a very beautiful woman and he told her, for the sake of my life, you say that you are my sister, which is half of the truth. She was his half sister according to Genesis chapter 20 verse 12. She was from his father, but not from the same mother. And therefore, we see him when he entered into the land of Egypt, the princes of Pharaoh looked upon the woman. She was very fair and they reported her to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh took her into his own house and the Lord plagued Pharaoh and all his house with great plagues. But we see how disturbed, uh, disturbed was Pharaoh. The next day he calls Abraham and he said to him, what have you done to me? Why did you lie to me? And you say, this was not your wife. Take your wife and your flock and your herds and leave this place. And so on leaving Egypt, the man was very rich in livestock. He was rich in silver, he was rich in gold. Also Lot, his nephew, was in the same position. Now, as they left, we see Abraham took the same route as he descended into Egypt, he came back the same way up. And what was the first thing that he did in chapter 13, we read, Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, Lot and Lot with him to the south. Abraham was very rich in livestock and in silver and gold and he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. And so... We see he came back to that first place. He established a place of worship to the Lord. And he came back and who was observing all this with him? His nephew Lot. Without a shadow of doubt, Lot understood Abraham's faith and conviction and devotion to the Lord God. And he saw that all the way through his life while he was there. Now, these were two men who came back from a heathen background. They worshipped idols, Ur the Chaldeans, and uh, the other city, Haran, where his father settled before he entered, before Abraham entered into the land of Canaan. 
apparently, according to some scholars, that these two cities had a lot of things in common. And one of the things they had in common that they worshipped the moon god Sin. And, and so although it was the distance between the two cities, Ur of the Chaldean and Haran was about 800 kilometers, but still they had something in common. So what I'm trying to say that these two men who were like everyone is here, heathens without God and the knowledge of God, but God knew them before the foundation of the world. He'd chosen them, he called them, he saved them. And now we see them following after that calling. And so, as chapter 13 mentions, Abraham has already made his way up with all that he had and his possession. He came back to the place of the altar. Now, what happened in there because of the abundance of the blessing that God has given these two men, they had great flocks, livestock. Uh, they were rich with male and female servants. They had tents everywhere. I mean, I, as I was meditating upon this uh, 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 text, I actually was drawn because I, I have a, a motorhome and I travel sometimes. And some of the things that are um, required of you to pack up things when you go away, uh, you just keep going inside the kitchen and gathering things. You go into the bedroom gathering things and you're only going away for about a week or a few days. And you accumulate so much stuff, but how much you're going to use, you know, only the, the journey will determine that. But these people had tents, had people, servants and livestock to care for every single person. So can you imagine the effort that went into erecting tents and looking after the little children that the families had and the animals that really required attention? So there was a lot of work involved. And we are told here that these men had a great possession, both of them. And it says the land could not even bear them, that the live stock that they had was that great, that the grazing land was not enough for them when they came back out of Egypt. And so what happened? The first thing we see is that the enemy moves in and he brings dispute amongst the brethren. And so what happened? The herdsmen of the livestock of Lot had a strife, they had a quarrel with the herdsmen of the livestock of Abraham. Why did you allow your cows to graze in this part here? Because this belongs to Abraham and so forth. And the argument began. And so there was a tension there. But what happened? What, what would you do in your position if you were in this situation? How would you handle the situation as a believer in God? What approach would you take? Well, we understand from Abraham, who was the mature believer, he took the first approach. And this is what he said in verse 8 of chapter 13. So Abraham said to Lot, please let there be no strife or quarrel between you and me and between your herdsmen and um, my herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you please separate from me if you take the left then i will go to the right if you take the right then i will go to the left so the appropriate thing according to middle eastern culture and i think it's very much biblical above all things is always to respect the elderly people to give them the first place i know in 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 the um, jewish culture a gray-headed man enters into a room everybody stands up in um, order of respect. And that's still practiced amongst the Middle Eastern even up until today. Elderly people to be respected, to be honored, to be given the prominent place because age speak and there is wisdom in gray hair, not in every situation that is, but I must mention that <laughs> some people get very gray hair early ages and they're not really acquainted with so much wisdom. But the principle is this, is that what Lot ought have done is to respect and honor his uncle. Rather than him jumping in and saying, Uncle, you know, I have been with you throughout the whole ordeal, and this is not fair. This is the right approach of a humble believer. But what we see, it was the opposite. We see that 
Abraham took the initiative and he actually humbled himself. Um, there's a great lesson to learn in this here. And that lesson is that the meekness in the genuine life of the faith. So Abraham revealed the genuineness of his faith in this humility. He approached his nephew and he told him, listen, look at the earth. Look at the land before you. You choose whatever you want. He gave him the first choice. Now, obviously Lot, being a very self-centered man, what did he do? He pounced and jumped at the opportunity. Um, Abraham, in doing that, he was a selfless believer. He was a very wise believer. And he was a man who fully trusted in the Lord to make all the decisions for him. Now, though he was the patriarch, he could have said to him, listen, the calling was not for you. The calling was mine. God called me and God promised me the land. God promised me the great name. God promised me to be a father of multitude. You are not nowhere to be seen in the picture. Step down. Now, he could have done that. But that, that is an indication of the maturity of that man's faith and trust and belief in God. Uh, may the Lord grant us that we will learn from these things as well. So, although he was the chief and the elder and who had the first call in, but he understood God's promises to him. Yet, he stepped down from all those privileges and he offered them to his nephew. He said, you've got the first choice. You choose what you want. You look at that land. If you decide to go to the right hand, I will separate myself to the left. I do not want any quarrels or strife to be between you and me. You are my son. Your father, who is my brother, is dead. I am now your father. He is in the place of his father. Yet we see the lack of respect in that man. So what, what, what did Lot do? Lot had the opportunity to make a choice. And sadly, the choice was not according to God's will. So he trodden under his foot all the traditions and all the respect. And above all, he neglected to seek the Lord completely. He was a completely opposite to Abraham. So as he jumped to the opportunity, we read in verse 10 these words. And Lot lift, lifted his eyes and saw all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he enlightened it to the garden of the Lord, to the land of Egypt. Uh, if you read the account of Genesis, the garden of the Lord was watered by four main rivers. It didn't need any man to toil it. So he's Lot imagining the beautiful fertility of the land. And um, he, he, he was a man who looked at prosperity. He was a man who was motivated by greed. He wanted to accumulate wealth. He, 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 he actually moved by sight and not by faith. And this is the trouble we have today in modern evangelical churches today. It is all about what we see, what we desire, what we want. It's not what God has called us for. And so here we see this man was motivated by greed and prosperity. Um, he didn't worry about the faith that Abraham practiced and he never sought the Lord. Although we are not to think the worst of Lot. Just remember this, that he was a just man. The Bible said that he was a just man. Now, don't draw the wrong conclusion or a picture in your mind when you read about someone being labeled a just man. That's not him being just. He was justified by God and he was made just uh, he was made just by God not from his own life or his own deeds or you know it was something that really made him to be in that position he was a just man at the same time because God dwelt in his heart we understand from the words of Peter in in his second epistle verse 7 it said that he wasn't happy in the life that he was living but the motivation that was in his heart that drove him to be prosperous made his life completely miserable. He was vexed inside. He wasn't happy. 
And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. The believer, the one who is born again, no matter where he goes in this life, if he is outside the fellowship of God and the fellowship of the saints, he is going to be vexing his spirit in any way or another, whether he lived in King's Cross or in St. Kilda in, in Melbourne or in Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, let's, let's face it, today the whole world is Sodom and Gomorrah, not just certain places. Wherever we go today, we've been assaulted, our eyes and our ears to the corruption that there is. Even our legislators have stepped out of all uh, uh, God guidelines and they've just gone completely the opposite. So we are living in modern Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, uh, very soon we will be in danger coming to church and declaring the truth. But uh, may the Lord be glorified if that time comes. Um, so despite what we read about Lot, he still is a just man. But he made the wrong choice. And he was motivated by greed. He lifted up his eyes. Now, this was the first downfall of this man. That was the first thing. He lifted his eyes. Um, we all understand that the book of Genesis chapter 3, it was the lifting up of the eyes that plunged the humanity into enmity with God and brought sin and death about. Exactly what Eve did. Eve looked at the tree. It was good for food and pleasant to the eyes. And so, and it, it makes one wise. Sadly, that's completely the wrong picture that Satan draws. As this man looked towards the plain of the Jordan, what did he see? He did not only see the pastures, but he saw something out there. And obviously, we understand from Scripture that Sodom and Gomorrah was wicked, was very, very wicked. All the people were wicked. Their practices were wicked. They were sexually perverted from the young to the old. And everybody within the regions would have known about these particular cities. So Sodom uh, um, Lot understood what went on over there. But the desire of his eye and the lust of his heart and the love of the world drew him out. And so that was the first downfall, the lifting up of the eyes. And may the Lord help us that before we lift our eyes to anything in this world, that our voices would be lifted in prayer and our hearts would be lifted in contrition to the Lord first and to seek his face there might be certain things in our life and we may think upon them that they are good for me. They will benefit me, but they will not agree with the will of God. That's why we must not be led by sight, but by faith. We must follow God's will no matter where. You see, so he lifted his eyes and he saw all the plain of the Jordan that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you come to Zoar. Now, where Abraham, we are told, he looked towards that city. Which city? In Hebrews chapter 11, by faith he saw that city. The city which had the foundations, whose builder and maker is the Lord. And he dwelt in tents for the rest of his life, him and his sons and grandsons. He just lived in tents, considered himself as what? As a sojourner and a foreigner. He was only a traveler in this land. And he knew that he longed for that city. For that eternal city that will never ever perish or be destroyed. Because that's the eternal hope that he looked for. That's why the Bible described him living in tents. Um, now I think some, some of the younger believers whenever they read these accounts they think that the whole earth lived in the primitive style, tents. Well, now there were cities. I, I mean, if you read in chapter 11, uh, we had the first city and the first government ever built. Uh, and that was Babel. And they built a massive tower over there. So they were advanced in, uh, uh, um, in, in, in building and advanced in maybe technology. I don't know. But, but they were well advanced. They understood uh, you know, how to build buildings and, and, and how to even have sewer back then. They understood all these things. But the description of Abraham dwelling in tent, it is a description that that man is moving on. This world is not our home. We are eventually moving on to that eternal place 
where God has promised us. But it was not with Lot. The lifting of the eyes was the downfall of this just man. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh and the pride of life is the downfall of every man or any man, whether he's a Christian or non-Christian. Now, Lot looked to the richness of the land and he wanted to be prosperous. He was very selfish. He didn't think of the consequences that he was going to reap. He didn't think of the results that's going to happen. All what he saw was now prosperity, making money, extending the livestock, gaining more tents, having more servants, and the business is expanding. May the Lord Jesus help us in our life never to think like that. Now, that's not to say that we do not uh, uh, take care of our material needs. The Lord has given us that right. But not to focus upon all these things. The promise of the Lord Jesus Christ to the disciples in his Sermon on the Mount is to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. And all these things, which is the earthly things, the temporal things, the food and the drink and the clothes shall be added unto us. That's what Christ said. But with Lot, he sought them first. And the kingdom of God was nowhere to be found in his life. And so, before we lift our eyes uh, to do anything and to look at anything, may the Lord help us to live our voices and our hearts to him. Um, in Proverbs chapter 3, which is a well-known verse 5 and 6, um, the Bible tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will what? He will direct your paths. You see, it's not to trust in oneself. It's not to trust in what we look at and see and see the prosperity. That's going to make me a great deal of profit and I'm going to have a bigger business and I'm going to buy a two-story house. Please, my brother and my sister, don't look on that. You will only receive what God has in portion for you. You're not going to get more. If you step out of God's will and out of God's plan for you, you will reap the consequences by making those choices and we will see the result that Lot reaped in his life because of that choice that he made. And so Lot never, never sought the Lord or his will, but rather followed the lust of his eyes. Then Lot chose for himself the plain of Jordan and journeyed east, and they separated from each other. Now that's the sad departure. I think there was a book written, it's called Sad Departure. But anyway, this is a sad departure between the brethren. You must understand, separation. What happened now is that Lot walked away from the protection of his uncle, who was a godly man. He walked away from the fellowship of the saints. He walked away from the presence of blood of the Lord where there was an altar established and there was intercession always going. Nevertheless, that Abraham never ceased. And I would believe he never ceased to intercede on his behalf. That's the contrast between these two choices. Lot... He walked away from all God's protection and from the fellowship of the saints and he did not care about his spiritual life and what will be made out of it. Remember, Lot was with his uncle Abraham from the beginning and as I mentioned earlier that he would have witnessed how his uncle conducted himself in the fear of the Lord. How Abraham was um, a godly man beside the failures. You see, Abraham denied uh, 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 lied twice. We, we see when he, he met as well, when he traveled to the land of Palestine, he met with Abimelech and he told his wife the same thing. And, and, and sadly to say that even his son Isaac adopted that lie and he said that about his wife. But nevertheless, the Lord understands your failures and mine. But in between two brackets, the bigger picture that this man was a godly man who loved the Lord. He was striving to do the will of God. He loved the things of God. He had devotion for Christ. He understood. But failures are always there. And that reveals our frailty as humans. We will never be perfected until that body is dropped and gone. And so the struggle is going to be there. But what God looks at is that general life in the two brackets from the beginning to the end. Abram was a godly man. Abram wanted the will of God. And he knew that his, lot, uh, his nephew Lot was the opposite. 
and Lot understood that his, his uncle was anything but like Lot, and he did not choose that. So he walked away. Um, he would have witnessed everything while he was with his uncle, but he didn't take it in consideration. A lot of people come into the church week in, week out. They hear the sermons. Maybe they might get touched for a season and then they walk away and they forget. If the word of God does not affect your heart and somehow, somehow conforms you little by little to the image of Christ, then you need to search your heart. Uh, you need to take that word of God and to examine your heart. Why, why am I hearing this message? Now, please understand, I am speaking to myself before I speak to you. Because we are all in need to be reminded how we ought to please and live, uh, live for the Lord and not for the world and not for the lust of the eyes. And so, now they separated themselves and Lot begins a slippery slide journey into a land that was God forsaken. While it says in verse 12, Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan, which is God's promised land, under God's watchful eyes. Obviously, God is sovereign. He watches everywhere, and he is everywhere. But in the sense, he had favored where the altar is because Abraham is a worshiper of God. And that's where Abraham dwelt. He didn't move one millimeter out of there. He knew he wanted to be in the presence of God. And what do, what do we see? He dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and he pitched his tent even as far as Sodom, the God-forsaken land. Can you imagine what Lot did? Obviously, when he lifted his eyes, he was on a high hill uh, around near Jerusalem, and he looked at all the plains. He could see everything very clearly. And as he, as he separated himself, he went and he took all those herds and flocks and male and female servants and the tents, and I don't know how long it would have taken to erect all these tents and to establish everything, but he made sure that he took the prominent place where it will look at the city. Now, obviously, he was not looking to participate in the sins of the city, but he did not understand what is going to happen to him because he looked at prosperity. He looked maybe, well, there, there is a... Uh, a good chance for me over there to make a good name for myself and establish my business a lot more. Um, you know, th there's a great opportunity. He didn't think of the wickedness of the city. He was thinking of business. Because obviously, if you're a born-again Christian, you will completely disagree with all these activities and the wickedness that goes on around your life every day. But what we see, he pitched his tent. Abraham lived in the presence of God, but he didn't. While he looked directly into Sodom, there was multitude of lights shining at night. There was music. Uh, there was all kinds of noises that was happening. And it would have probably triggered something in Lot's heart to find out what is in that city. So the Bible tells us in verse 13 of chapter 13, the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. That's the description. So... He pitched his tent, first of all, in the plains, looking towards there. Um, in 13, 12, we just read, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. That was his first step towards slippery slide life. In chapter 14, what we see, um, an, uh, an event occurred there. There was four kings led by Chedaloma, who was a king that was well known. And they had armies, they came in. And they conquered Sodom and they took all the people captives. And amongst them, they took Lot. Now, in chapter 14, look what it says in verse 12. They also took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom. He was no longer living towards Sodom. But we find him in this chapter that he is in Sodom, living in that city. So he must have moved his tent and he made that place to be his abode. He lived in that city and he knew what went on in the city. But what we see, the Lord in his graciousness, he sent Abraham to deliver Lot. And Abraham had 318 servants and they were trained 
they must have been very skilled but the victory belongs to the Lord he's the one who gives the, the victory so with 318 men am I right 318 or were they or something like that 308 318 men they went and conquered the four kings and they restored lot and everything that he had but strangely enough what do we find you would think that lot would have learned a lesson from what has taken place and he would have had a message to his mind from the lord saying that you need to leave that city because there's more destruction coming but what do we find you only need to read chapter 19 and verse 1 and you will find out as the angels approach the city to destroy it we find lot sitting at the gate of the city he has become a citizen he has been made a judge and to deal with what to deal with the affairs of the wicked those who are sexually perverted how can you deal in a council like that what advice can you do we are not told that he was preaching the gospel because later on you'll find out that he was a jester and a joker in the eyes of his brother-in-laws so the man lost his testimony completely how sad lot sat and he sat in the gate of the city and he was dealing with the affairs of the people of sodom and gomorrah this is a very lamentable situation in the life of any child of god when you lose your testimony uh, you've lost that blessing uh, you know people will point the finger at you it is sad really really is sad and the lord said to abraham now here's the contrast between the choices lot lifted up his eyes he made the choice he departed and he reaped the consequences verse 14 and the lord said to abraham after lot had separated from him lift your eyes you see the difference here lot lifted his eyes abraham was commanded by the lord to lift his eyes so God here is giving Abraham this opportunity and he made the choice for him. Lift your eyes. Um, and then he told him, now look from the place which you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. That's including all the plain of the Jordan, everything there, including where Lot went. The Lord is going to give everything to you. Not just this land, but all land is going to be yours. Um, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendant forever. And I will make your descendant as the dust of the earth. So if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through it, its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abraham moved his tent and went and dwelt by the oaks trees of memory which are in hebron and he built an altar unto the lord you see that building an altar repetitively he established the place of worship the believer cannot do without worship in the lord he could not live one moment you would be like a fish out of the water you can't live without establishing worship now the altar was a big thing in my life when i first became a christian I was converted in a brethren church and probably sister Bron will understand that the emphasis of all the brethren teaching is that relationship fellowship with the Lord you need to build an altar in your home you need to have your family for prayer you need to teach them and catechize them in the way of the Lord without that you will be spiritually dead you need to have that now obviously in some cases it becomes legalistic and if you if you forget to read your bible today oh satan is going to you know lurk upon you but that, that's not the, ca the, the case the, the whole idea is that establishing an altar is acknowledging how much the lord loved you and how much he graciously forgave you for all your filth and how he ransomed you from this world with the precious blood of his son you were adopted into the family of god now abraham knew that and he began to worship with sacrifice upon the love of God. And that's what Abraham did. Abraham's choice was God's choice. And Lot's was his own. And I'll try not to be much longer. I wasn't given a time, so I really apologize. I don't want to keep you too late. I will cut it short. And I'm just going to give you a, a brief summary 
of the choices of these two men um, when their names are mentioned or when we remember them or when we read about them what would be the first thing that would come into your mind and and i would like to say what would people think of you the brothers and the sisters and the christians around you and your neighbors and your friends when your name is mentioned um, again that is applicable in all our life and so let's just have a look when lot's name is remembered or mentioned what do we remember what do we think of well, I've written maybe um, 12, 12 highlighting things about the life of Lot. Now, you could probably pick more or pick less, but here's one of them. We remember a life of spiritual shipwreck. That's the first thing we, we remember because he was a just man and his spiritual life was completely ruined. There was no Christian qualities whatsoever, except we know that God sent the angels to deliver him a life that is full of backsliding he lifted his eyes he moved pitched his tent the next thing he's in sodom and gomorrah and then lastly he's sitting at the gate although he was in the company of the greatest believer that ever lived that was his uncle abraham it did not affect him it did not affect him his life completely slid back um, Scripture never mentions that he lot followed after God or the things of God. He rather chose the opposite. Lot is not known to have built an altar to the Lord or even prayed to God in Scripture anyway. He lived for, um, far away from God's presence and his people, that's God's people, in the most sexually depraved city on the face of the earth. He was a jester in the eyes of his sons-in-law. And we read that in Genesis 19, 4, when, uh, 14. When the angels told him to go and get his family out. And so as he went to report that the Lord is coming to destroy the cities, he said to them, make haste, quickly, come on. These cities are going to be burnt tomorrow. <laughs> and his sons-in-laws looked at him and said, come on, stop joking, Dad. You're joking, aren't you? He was a jester in their eyes. I mean, I, I conclude out of that that he must have been a man who spoke a lot of jokes. And may God help us. There is time for everything. There is time for a decent joke. That's fine. But if you joke all the time, no one is going to take you serious. It's like the boy who cried wolf. No one believed him at the end. So he was a jester. Because of the choices that he had made, he brought ruin to himself first and ruin to all his family. Now, by the way, I'd like to say something. If you notice, if you read chapter 11, 12, and 13, and even 14, you'll never, ever read about his wife or family. Some suggest that he would have, maybe he would have married in Sodom. Maybe he married, he married a Sodomite woman. Uh, obviously not in the sense that it means, but from Sodom. Um, but we don't know. We don't know anything. But what we understand is just the small narrative that mentions his two virgin daughters, and the other daughters that were in Sodom, and then his wife. But we don't understand who she is, where she came from, how he married her. But what we understand that he brought ruin to their life regardless. Being the head of the home, he should have led them in the way of the Lord, but he led them in the opposite. So he lost some of his daughters in the destruction of Sodom when he warned them and they didn't listen. Now he offered his two virgin daughters to the wicked man of Sodom to do whatever they please. My goodness, whenever you read of that incident, that would make your hair stand. Our children are a gift from the Lord to us and we will protect them with the apple of our eyes. Um, that is a Middle Eastern saying. <laughs> you know how precious is the apple of your eye. Your children are that precious. They're a heritage of the Lord. And this man, obviously it was a custom that those who enter under your roof, they'll be under your protection. But you don't trade your precious girls for them. See, he said, no, my brethren, to the people of Sodom, don't you ever think of hurting these two men that entered under my roof, but take my two daughters and do as you wish with them. Shame on any man who claims to believe in God and say these things. That, how far did that man descend? He, he did not realize himself. He lived in compromise. It is such a sad story to read. 
It really is a heartbreak. And look, we are no better. Today we are giving our children to the, the media and the iPads and the iPhones. Please forgive me, but I had to say these things because I see it every day. Uh, you, you know, some children can watch anything they want and, and, and they can do anything they want and they can befriend any friend they want. You know what? That's worse than giving your children to Moloch. You see, please, brothers and sisters, think about that. Think about that. We are to learn from everything that has been written. You see, Abraham was the opposite. He took his only son, the one that he loved, the promised son, and he said to the Lord, here he is. He went to Mount Moriah and he said, I will do it because he believed that God will raise him up. That's the difference. The other man offered his sons to the world, uh, his daughters to the world. And some of our Christian brethren do the same thing without knowing. May the Lord awaken our hearts. Now, that's just a, um, an, an extra fill in there I just put. <laughs> so <laughs> please do not be offended at the word of God, but receive it because it ought to help us to be pleasing unto the Lord. So he offered this to virgin. His wife turned into a pillar of salt because her heart was still in there. As, they, as the city was being destroyed, the angels commanded them, don't look back, just go forward. Now, she looked back and apparently in, in that region, a lot of Middle Eastern people, especially the Muslim culture, believe that there is a statue that looks like, they still call it till this day, Lot's wife. And that's well known in the Middle East. So she is still um, the memory of Lot. He escaped with the skin of, the, of his teeth, to borrow the language of Job. It means that he was saved, as it were, by fire. He took nothing of all what he accumulated for, the greed that drove him, the motivation that wanted him to prosper. He walked away from that land with nothing in his hand. If you remember when the angels of the Lord came to destroy the cities and they told him, make haste, and then they had to drag him. The Bible said that he lingered. He knew that the city was going to be destroyed. But the Bible said that he lingered. Why are you lingering? You see, there was something that drew him there. There was, there was all his banking and his possession and, and everything he established in that city. And the Lord has reserved it for the fire and brimstone. And that's what will happen when we lay our soft treasures on this earth. We reap the consequences of the choices that we make. And so, and lastly, which is not a really nice thing to mention the incest relationship that he had with his two daughters and they were the result of having the two most enemy nations against the people of Israel and they were the Moabites and the Ammonites without going in details what his daughters did and so what about when Abraham is mentioned now I love this Proverbs chapter 10 verse 7 it says the memory of the righteous is blessing or is blessed but the name of the wicked will rot what's the memory of the righteous the memory of the righteous is blessed every time you remember a godly man there is a blessing in his remembrance because of he uh, who he, he was in his faith to the lord how he conducted himself how he lived for christ how he acknowledged who the lord was and this was abraham Without the failures, we all have them, as I said, but that's not the point that God emphasizes on. God looks at the heart that is devoted to him. And so he was a man of great faith. And if I would take the liberty and say, I think he was the man of the greatest faith. No one is mentioned more frequently in scripture, more than Abraham, and his faith is prominent. It's well known. He just walked out from the land of Eden by heeding unto the voice of God to follow and he did not see anything. He followed because he believed in God. He was a man of great faith. And he believed in the Lord. And the Bible tells us, he, God, accounted for him for righteousness. He was a man of the altar. And that's so important. He worshipped God. He had devotion for God. In chapter 12, verse 7, he built an altar unto God. 12, verse 8, he built an altar unto God. Chapter 13, 3 and 4, he built an altar unto the Lord. Uh, chapter 13, 18, he built an altar unto the Lord. Chapter 22, he built an altar. He was a man of the altar wherever he went, in the sight of the Perizzite and the Canaanite. All what he did, he's revealed his faith. 
He was an evangelist. He spoke about his faith by erecting an altar. He was not reserving. He was not shameful by declaring what he believed in. This was the man Abraham. And when we remember him, we see him in that picture. We see who he is. And he was obedient to God. He was called the friend of God. No one else in the Bible was called the friend of God. He was called the friend of God, according to 2 Chronicles 27. He was not the friend of the world, but Lot was. Sadly, would you be known by that? Are you the friend of God or the friend of the world? Do you abhor the world? Do you separate yourself from the world? Do people look at you and say, this man, this woman are really godly? They love the Lord and there are boundaries where they will not step over because of their devotion for Christ. May that be said of all of us, that God will get all the glory. He was obedient to God. He sacrificed, uh, sorry, he separated himself from the world completely. That's why he dwelt in tents. He was willing to offer his only son to God when he was tested by the Lord. And the Lord tested Abraham. What a beautiful, beautiful gesture that the Lord tested him. But he knew his heart. But he wanted us to learn. He commanded his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. In chapter 18, we read that. Now, let me ask you, brother and sister, what is the choice that you make in your life? Which one would you choose? Obviously, we all would choose Abraham. Now, in conclusion, I will say these words. This message and this story, although it's been summarized, and there's so much, a lot more to speak about. But whenever we come before the Lord and hear his word being preached to us, there is something for us to learn and to glean from. Because if we read in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for whatever things were written before, they were written for our own learning, Paul said. He again said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, speaking of the wilderness journey about the people of God, he said, now all these things happened to them back there as examples and that were written for our admonition. So whatever is written here was written for our learning and it was written for our admonition that we may be transformed daily to the image of his blessed son and may the name of the lord be glorified forever amen let's bow our head in a word of prayer our gracious and loving father in the light of your precious word we are deeply convicted and uh, we do acknowledge that oftentimes we behave mostly like lot in many ways but lord we thank you for your grace we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your long suffering towards us. Indeed, you are a good God who loved sinners who were wretched, undone, had no hope. You called us your own. You wrote our names in the book of life. And it's something that we do not deserve. If anything, Father, we deserve your righteous judgment. But we thank you for our Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for that love that it was extended to us while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gave him for us freely. And so, Father, as we meditated upon the word of God this morning, may this be a lesson in our life about the choices that we take daily. May we seek you. May our eyes look to the Lamb of God. And may our voices be lifted up in prayer to seek your will and your, weak, uh, your will alone. Um, help us that when we look, our eyes will not be affected, but let our heart be lifted to you and to seek directions. Uh, help us to apply the Proverbs 3 unto our life to acknowledge you in all our ways and to lean not on our own understanding, but on the wisdom of God. Father, we thank you once more for meeting with us. Thank you for blessing our life. Thank you for this church. Thank you for every head that's bowed before you. We pray for a blessing. Upon the young and the old, we pray for the pastor of the church, the people that work in the church, 
and they all labor for the gospel of Jesus Christ. May you increase them in wisdom and knowledge and give them strength within the inner man that they will continue to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to this lost world. And so, Father, we thank you and we ask you that Christ will be exalted, will be honored. Please answer our prayers for his sake and in his glorious name we give you glory and honor forever and ever. Amen.